Welcome, everyone. I'm Justin Paperni with White Collar Advice. So grateful that you're with us today. And I'm so proud to introduce my friend and colleague, Adam Clausen, to our program. Hi, Adam. Good morning, Justin. Happy to be here with you today. Thank you so much. Many of our viewers know Ro Clausen, your partner. Uh, we've done some videos together. And of course, she runs Strong Prison Wives and a phenomenal YouTube channel and group. I'll put up a link to her channel. Mm -hmm. But today, I want to talk about your journey and offer some advice to people who are traversing the criminal justice system. As we jump in, can you give us a couple of minutes on your background? I know the subject line I put in this video kind of gives it away. 20 years, five months, and 17 days sort of trumps the 18 months I've served in prison. <laughs> That's a different conversation. Give us a couple of minutes on your journey and how you ended up here today. Uh, my case began back in uh, 2000, early 2000. I was arrested for a string of robberies. Uh, during each of those robberies, uh, I possessed a firearm, had that on my possession, in my person, and because of that, uh, once I took that case to trial, each of those firearm possession charges triggered a mandatory minimum sentence of consecutive 25-year sentences that were stacked one on top of the other. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I received eight years for the actual robberies that I committed and another 205 years on top of that for the use of a firearm. Obviously, question. question. Sure. Many yeah. of the, the people who come across our channel, some have pled guilty, some are going through discovery with counsel, some are going to go to trial. In your case, you broke the law. What was the reasoning behind going to trial versus offering or accepting a, a plea agreement? Hmm. Well, two things. First, mm -hmm. I rather naively believed uh, that I could somehow, uh, or I had a chance to, to potentially beat the case, which wasn't realistic considering you know the, the resources of the government and the weight of the evidence against me. But you know, part of that was my naivety, also my immaturity. Uh, but the other component there was that the alternative which was offered to me was full cooperation. Mm -hmm. And what that entailed at that time was for me to provide information against a multitude of other individuals who I had friendly relationships with, but who I honestly wasn't doing anything illegal with, but the government believed that I could make some connections and help them further additional cases. And for me personally, uh, I was not willing to do that. I did not want to exchange myself for someone else to put them in the same situation. Uh, but I understand that you know everyone's cir circumstances are different. Uh, each situation is unique. And for me at that time, just that was the decision that I was willing to make to face those charges, those, those mandatory minimum sentences. And obviously it, didn't, it did not work out very well for me. Now, I know uh, someone who's important in your life and, and someone with whom I'm proud to work with as well as Sean Hopwood, who also went to prison for, for robbing banks. Without getting into all the nuances and helping our audience understand the disparity in, disparity in sentencing versus going to trial and pleading guilty, generally speaking, is what you did similar to Sean? Because I know he still served 11 or 12 years in prison. And as I read, your ultimate sentence was 213 years, which is incredible. So is it similar what you and Sean did? Very, very similar. Same mm -hmm. set of circumstances. He robbed banks. I was robbing illegal enterprises. Mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately, a robbery is a robbery. And when there's a firearm involved, it is up to the prosecutor to determine whether or not they want to pursue those mandatory minimums. Sean's prosecutor did not pursue those. Mine did. And that's uh, one of the things, Sean and I have spoken much about this over the years, you know, why he was... Uh, so adamant about being an advocate for me because he was given that uh, second chance at life, even though he served 12 years, considerable amount of time. Uh, he wanted me to have that same opportunity. And ultimately, he won that opportunity for me. So there's so much out there about your story with Roe online. One question I know people will be wondering just a few minutes into this video is, if you had a 213-year sentence, why are we speaking today after only serving 20 years, five months, and 17 days? People are going to text, is he doing this from prison? Did he escape? 
Yeah. What is he? <laughs> what what's going on here? So how am I able to interview you today from Nevada after getting sentenced to 213 years in prison? Well, after only 20 years. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sean was able. Sean was able to find a means to get me back in front of a judge, because ultimately this was something that I always believed. In. When I was sentenced to 213 years, I said, this is ridiculous. No one died. No one was seriously injured. At some point, you know, reason is going to prevail. I'm going to get another opportunity. And that shaped my mindset early on. But ultimately, it was Sean finding that means within the First Step Act mm -hmm. and keying in on the compassionate relief uh, provision that was greatly expanded. That gave me the vehicle to get back in front of a judge for Sean to state the case that my sentence was just unjust. It was far too long. And on my end, that I had done the work while in prison, that I had compiled a record of you know, personal growth, various achievements on the inside that a judge and the prosecutor in my case could get behind and say, you know what? He's done enough time. He's earned another opportunity or another chance at life. And ultimately I was granted compassionate release on August 12th. And my wife and I eventually made our way out here to Las Vegas. And, and now this is it. This is our life. You know, I wake up every morning incredibly grateful for, for the opportunity, for the new life that's been given to us. And I look out the window at the, at the you know, beautiful, blue skies uh, and you know, I'm just loving life right now. So let's talk about your ability to love life and be so connected with Roe and all of the blessings that have come your way. I know from your story, but I want you to articulate much of that success hinges on what you began to do on the inside. I have discussed and Michael Santos taught me that whether someone serves a year, 10, 20, 30, 40 years, if you're not using your time in prison productively, life on the other side could be much more difficult. You release to a whole new set of problems. So can you help our audience understand, despite getting sentenced to 213 years, when your transformation began and how you even mustered the strength as Michael did through 26 years in prison, how you even managed to get out of bed and be productive and transform yourself? Walk us through that mindset that you had to cultivate from a high security prison. Hmm. You know, there's a quote that I love. How do you eat an elephant hmm. one bite at a time, right? Yeah. So when something seems so seemingly insurmountable, you just got to focus on what's right in front of you. And for me, coming into the system at a young age, I was still in my early 20s. Uh, I had a lot of excess energy to, mm -hmm. to let out. And I was fortunate to find my way into the gym. Uh, and I discovered that I had a real passion for fitness. I had been an athlete in my youth. So this was kind of a natural extension of that for me. Uh, and there were a few individuals who had been in the system a while that, you know, saw the time that I had and kind of helped to guide me, get me on the right track. I'm incredibly fortunate to this day. Uh, one of them happens to be, you know, my closest, dearest uh, friends. And to get me on the track, not only towards being able to utilize fitness to, to improve my own health and well-being, but he created an opportunity for me to teach classes, fitness classes, where I was able to share that passion with others. And through that, you know, I really began to find my sense of purpose and utilizing my, my natural strengths and skills, uh, sharing that with others became a, a real driving force. And although I always believed uh, that I was going to gain some relief at some point, I had to go through the legal process that helped get me through it step by step. Uh, and eventually over time, my focus began to shift from not just being not solely related to fitness, although I do believe that that's a key component to creating a, a healthy, balanced life. Uh, it's an integral part. I had to focus more on the introspective portion and that kind of took me in a different direction. So you mentioned the biting of an elephant going, going day by day. And mm -hmm. is that how you're, we're able to successfully manage 
a relationship from the inside without getting into all of the details. I know you and Ro are together and you're going to grow your business and your brand together. And you're so transparent mm -hmm. with the live videos you do on Facebook and on the Strong Prison Wives YouTube channel. So you're very open about your life together and the ups and downs of uh, just managing a relationship while in custody. Many defendants, when they go into the system, are thinking of divorce, going through a divorce, separated from their children. The idea of doing 20 years is insurmountable. One year, one day can be tough, right? It's all relative to our life. Can you offer a few tips before we transition to your life on the outside on how you were able to successfully manage your relationship from the inside through so many Thanksgivings and Christmases and without even a really knowing that you would ever come home, just hoping, offer some tips to those who are going through it. Well, I would say, and I need to stress this, that I would not be here today having this conversation if it was not for Ro, if it was not for our relationship. Uh, her support over the years, you know, was we've been together a little over 11 years now and you know, even from the very beginning, she always believed in me and encouraged me. What's been unique about our relationship, uh, because I've obviously I've witnessed many relationships during my 20 plus years in prison. And, you know, I've taken note of the ones that have worked and the many that have failed. Mm -hmm. For us, it was about as we were taking steps in, in personally growing, becoming more you know, self-aware, uh, assessing our own needs and values. It was about sharing those. It was about clear communication so that we were able to learn and grow together instead of growing apart, which is unfortunately what happens with most couples. They either grow apart or one uh, of the, the persons in the relationship becomes stagnant. And unfortunately, it's often the fact that while we're on the inside, we're able to have this time and space to, to focus on fitness and, and read and really expand our knowledge and, and learn about ourselves that as we begin to evolve, our loved ones on the outside, especially our, our significant other, they're kind of stuck in a waiting game. They're just holding on. They're like, if I can just make it through until he gets home, then we'll figure it out. We'll work it out. Yeah. And what's happening during that period is they're growing apart. You know, resentment sometimes starts to set in like, man, he's in prison. He's got all this time and he's doing all these great things and he's looking good and he's feeling good. And I'm out here stuck waiting for my life to get on. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to bridge that? How are we going to come together? How are we going to make sure that we're supporting one another in a healthy way where we're clearly communicating each other's needs so that when the time comes, because that release date, it's going to get here eventually. Mm -hmm. And when it does, you need to be on the same page. There needs to be clear expectations for one another. And so that neither one of you gets overwhelmed because the person on the outside has learned to do this on their own. And the person on the inside, you know, feels like they're coming back to this place that they have in life. And if those two people haven't, you know, clarified those expectations and come to some common ground, there's going to be some friction in that transition. So even if you made it through this seemingly, you know, insurmountable period of time, even if that time was only six months, a year, to every person, the time that they are doing is significant. And I would never say anything to anyone to diminish the time that they're facing nor the time that they're doing, because it is, it's a considerable portion of your life. And you need to figure out how to make the most of it. And it's very important with couples that you're doing that together. Well, in, in addition to the managing successfully the relationship with Roe and fitness mm -hmm. and avoiding problems in prison, that's, that's part of the reason you were able to benefit from the First Step Act. Can you help us, sure. before we transition to life on the inside, uh, talk about literature. When I met Michael Santos in prison, he helped, he taught me about the trial of Socrates and how that really impacted him when he was sitting in a county jail before he got sentenced to 45 years and it helped him develop discipline and he wanted to become a man of integrity. And he introduced me to a book that you had mentioned, Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. And of course, as a Jew, that really Im impacted me, finding sure. dignity in struggle. So in addition to fitness and managing your relationship and avoiding problems, can you talk about a few books that helped uh, shape your time on the inside? Uh, let me 
the list of books is is endless and and to really try and narrow that down uh what i would say is this i've studied other successful individuals mm -hmm. so to be able to read michael's story michael santos sean hopwoods mm -hmm. your story and a number of others uh there's a multitude of people out there for me it was about finding you know those individuals who had successfully navigated the system mm -hmm. and figure out what had worked for them and then for me it was about is there any way that i can improve upon this yeah a big part of that was continuing to learn and to grow on a, on a personal basis those books that have been most influential to me as you said uh victor frankl's man's search for meaning mm -hmm. that was that was something probably the most recommended book mm -hmm. uh and especially it's it's you know amazingly brief there is just yeah. so much it's yeah. content rich and, and yet so brief so uh that was extremely impactful uh there have been a number of other books love languages the five love languages we were just talking about relationships it was important for my wife and i for ro and i to make sure that we were speaking the same language i said mm -hmm. i stress the importance of communication and for us to be on the same page, to, to know how I could best meet her needs. If I was not physically there, how can I do this through this relationship that's gonna be based primarily on, on good lines of communication? So the five love languages was instrumental in, in helping with that. So uh, let's, let's transition to your life on the outside. And for everyone watching, sure. I, Adam and I had been texting for a few days about what to cover in this video because he's done a number of videos. There's a lot of content out there. And I mm -hmm. thought it would be interesting because of the success that he's had on the, the outside. I know that's a du direct result of what he did on the inside. And I texted him yesterday, essentially saying a lot of people say they're going to do something in prison and they may do it. Then they come home and they struggle. I use the example of, of fitness as an example. The majority of mm -hmm. a number of people may go to prison. They lose the 50, 60. I've had known defendants that have lost 150 pounds. And within a year, they're back on the inside with temptation and food and wine. And you can't walk the track for eight hours a day when you're home working on probation and the weight comes back on or they're not as connected. So can you help us understand the follow through between what you did and what you said you were going to do in prison and now carrying that over into the frenetic pace of, of the real world, how you're doing it? Sure. You know, it's been my experience because I've worked with literally thousands of guys over the years helping them to develop a plan for not only how they were going to, to utilize their time on the inside, but more importantly, how they were going to successfully transition from the inside to the outside, because everyone has these dreams and, and goals and aspirations of what they want to do once, once they're released. But few people have the means, have really thought it through and figured out how to bridge that gap. There's generally some, some or a lot of space in between that and the mindset is if i could just get out the door mm -hmm. i'll figure it out then things will fall into place well that's that's not a practical means of attaining any sort of goal you need to have you know some continuity there so for me it's always been about making sure that that transition uh is smooth and making sure that everything is, is clearly laid out are there some things on the other side that surprise you? For example, my measly 18 month prison sentence, people presumed I'd come home. The first thing I'd want to do is you know, eat and just gorge myself food that I had missed or want to have sex with everyone. You know, it's like I that wasn't the priority for me. I was anxious to, to work and to begin build, rebuilding sure. my life professionally. And so are there things that have surprised you? Uh, on the other side, uh, help us understand some things that have been good, things that have, have been not so good. You're now, g give us a little taste of, uh, of what your experience has been like and if things, some things have not gone according to plan. And this is, I'm almost reluctant to, to admit how smoothly I have transitioned from inside to out because I don't mean to minimize anyone else's experience. Mm -hmm. A lot of individuals struggle with this transition psychologically and, and physically in that transition. As you said, it's difficult to maintain the habits that you establish on the inside here on the outside when you have all these additional responsibilities. For me, I was very intentional about this. 
you know, after helping so many, I had to make sure that my own plan, you know, was rock solid. Yeah. And even though it happened rather quickly, my release, you know, we'd been planning for years what this was going to look like. And uh, by taking the time to envision what that transition looked like and to figure out what I wanted to do on a day-to-day -day basis, the day after I stepped out of prison, that next morning, I got up at the same time. I went through my same early morning routine, stretching like calisthenics, my coffee, my breakfast. Obviously, my breakfast was a little bit better on the outside. You know, I was able to, to, to have the ideal where, you know, in, in prison, you're, you're limited, right? Yeah, I get so it. So that was an immediate improvement. Uh, but to be able to get up in the, and again, like with the television, I was fortunate to, to have a situation where each morning when I got up in prison, uh, I had a TV that was on CNBC. So that was something that I had focused on was how I got my news every morning. I continued those things on the outside. Mm -hmm. And the, the biggest change for me was that I have someone with me all the time now. Mm -hmm. I have my, my partner, uh, my best friend. As you've seen, Ro and I, our relationship is, is built around our, our passion for health and wellness. So, you know, she was excited to join me in, you know, some of these healthy daily habits. She needs to sleep in a little bit later. So it gives me some free time in the morning, you know, to where I can still do my thing. And, you know, we figure out where we come together and how we can at the same time, you know, I'm extremely driven. The day after I got out, it was about who do I need to call? What do I need to do? I'm trying to get things moving. I've spent 20 years in prison. I've got some things that I want to accomplish out yeah. here. So I was immediately on that. And I know probably most of your clients, you know, they're successful individuals. They're highly driven. They've already achieved that level of success. They expect to do it again. So I'm sure they can relate to that feeling of, man, I got this list. Let me get right to it but I was very cautious. I was cautious in regard to making sure that I maintained the priorities that I set on the inside. While I was still able to be relatively objective on my outside life, what is my ideal life going to be like? I set those priorities while I still had a little bit of separation. And as I transitioned out into it, I was able to constantly assess and go back and say, this is what I said was a priority my health, my well-being, the time that I spend with my wife on a daily basis, these need to maintain a priority. I can work everything else around them. I can have it all. I can have health and well-being and I can have success. The two go hand in hand. It's figuring out how to do that, how to create that balance. And that's something that she and I thus far have been pretty successful at doing. So as we close Close up this this interview. I hope that the first of, of many, many of our viewers are home from prison. They're getting ready to, to surrender. And much of the most of the time, white collar crime cases, but all everyone comes across our channel. If someone's getting ready to go in for six months or or a year, 18 months in, in my case, and I know relative to your sentence, it's it's nothing, but it is still a big time in our life and part in our life. Because it can be a lifelong sanction in white collar cases. You could be fighting your case for three years in my case, and you come home, you're on probation, you have to rebuild. A couple of things I've noticed from you when we would communicate while you were on the inside, you were incredibly grateful. I never sensed any, there was no envy coming out of you, appreciative for all your, your blessings, but really re remarkable. A number of people going to prison feel wronged and or feel the sanction was way too long, even if they did something wrong. So as we wrap up this video, can you offer advice to someone who's in the system, getting ready to go in and can a, a vision, envision even beginning to prepare for the other side because they haven't even gone in. Wrap up with some advice for a soon to be federal prisoner. As I said before, whatever the time you're facing or doing you know, to that person, it, it's significant. Uh, and I believe we need to acknowledge that. Acknowledge the time and more importantly, acknowledge the feelings. Whatever feelings you're grappling with, if there is a level of resentment, if there's anger, those are natural. Those are things that we need to, to not only be aware of, but to acknowledge, to acknowledge, to work through them. What I like to come back to is it's basically, it's a process of grieving, right? 
grief is a natural process in life. When you lose someone, it takes time. You need to work through those emotions. Going to prison, there's going to be grieving on the other side. You've just lost a portion of your life, of your liberty. And in dealing with those emotions that come along with it, that grieving process, you know, you, you need to be conscious of it. You need to be able to express that. And you need to know that you have the support. You know, basically, the majority of people have a good uh, support network. Even when you're going through a, a difficult period, there's going to be someone or a few people that are close to you that want to be there for you. It's important that we allow ourselves. I know that that was one of the most difficult things for me, to allow others to be there for me. Mm -hmm. When I allowed that support to be there, it took a weight off of me. I was able to really uh, focus on what I needed to do for myself to get to a, a healthy, balanced place because I couldn't seek to do for anyone else, uh, whether it's you know the loved ones I left behind or what I intended to do in the future until I first dealt with that. Mm -hmm. you know, that's the, the only way to really move forward is, is to deal with that portion of your past and to realize, hey, you have a tremendous opportunity in front of you. Whatever period of incarceration you're going to go through, you're going to have the time to focus on yourself and to do the things that you've probably been putting off for a long time, to read, to focus on your fitness, that once you get out, you're not going to have all this time again. So make the most of that opportunity, develop those healthy habits now that are going to serve you for the rest of your life. This is your chance to go back, kind of get a fresh reset on yourself and to, to stay focused on the healthy uh, aspects of your life going forward. I wish I had that message after I lost my job for facilitating a fraud in 2005. Mm -hmm. And from there, a three-year investigation began where I made a lot of bad decisions and made matters worse for everyone. It's an incredible message, one I wish I had, one that everyone is, who is going to hear it will benefit from, presuming they implement the habits and the values uh, that, that you speak of. So I'm really grateful you took the time to join us. I know you're going to be connecting with clients of ours. They can benefit from your mindset, your experience, and everything that accompanies serving 20 years, five months, and 17 days, and a remarkable journey through prison. I'm grateful to know Ro and you and uh, that you've allowed yourself to contribute to our channel. And it's so nice to connect with you through this mechanism rather than core links or the old way that we, yes. we used to communicate. <laughs> so it's Much so wonderful to see. It's better. Thank you for contributing uh, to our channel. I'm very grateful. Well, we're grateful to to be here with you and to support your work, which is so much, uh, it's desperately needed and much appreciated. So thank you for having us. Of course.